welcome uh, everyone and thank you for showing up in so large number you remember if you cannot replace yourself in life when you do something with somebody else then you have not done your job that's what i would say so hands free NFE hands free automation says that we replace ourselves and every time we try to replace the under, underlying infrastructure or underlying uh, components change and we are again back to square one so hopefully machine learning is one which will help us do that so this is prakash ramchandran i am uh, the board of directors of openstack currently working for dell and i will have two more people i have uh, sought help in this effort one is professor gokhale who did la yesterday machine uh, on the uh, machine learning and uh, today we are going to have him do for the automation aspects second i have uh, chosen uh, michael uh, tian who is working in the dell labs so we have one the research the other the practical aspects and trying to stitch them together so this is a hopefully around 40 minutes and so i will try to speed up myself so that i can give the people who are right for this to help us understand so the agenda here is very clear what are the nfe automation challenges we are facing especially specific to service and infrastructure automation because automation is plenty and we are talking in nfe context for what can we do for service what can we do for infrastructure so that is the main and at the same time standards are evolving so we have to see what standards to adopt and what uh, makes sense what doesn't because uh, as you have already seen that open source runs ahead and uh, the standards try to the other way around standards try to adopt to them and then there is a Uh, tension between the two and that's welcome that's good for industry then we'll bring to see what machine learning has to offer us how we can use that for automation and then practical view point as i said from michael tian two of them and then we'll see what next so with that i will start with the nfe automation challenges so you can look at this is clearly you can see what what is happening is uh because of the technology changes we are trying to get end to end automation yeah you can do silos of automation but how do we address all across end to end and that means you need interoperability which is again a moving target and then the data center planning because you did something and then it's end of life and you need to invest but you don't know where to invest how to invest so data center design challenges planning challenges are there then you can see service awareness is not there if you are you want to programmatically do everything but the service doesn't understand what the infrastructure and we say it doesn't need to understand but that's a debatable thing how do we go about it so there are issues there so you can see the limitations of the programmability of the infrastructure as well what we can do to ensure that this happens uh, in a zero touch or uh, hands free environment as we call it so these are the various uh, challenges which we face and pocs after pocs we do but at the end we need to deliver something to ensure that the service providers enterprises are all able to use it effectively so data center challenges today as you see we always talk about oh i want to reduce the capex i want to reduce the opex i want to do something time to market okay all these are uh, uh, really business point of view and definitely it drives the industry but at the same time the challenges which we address we have to make sure that they are able to address so what's new in standards and open stack few things Uh, from the standard zsm in hc has taken up the approach to automation and it has defined the various areas where it will address and it is starting with the uh, network slicing which is 5g centric of course but it requires the radio network as well as the 
uh, uh, core networks to map the various characteristics and have a slicing which goes end to end for specific use cases like IoT and could be for the edge, could be for the uh, extremely mobile broadband 4K like videos. So you are going to have this uh, while what HC moves at the same time we are seeing what can they do? Yeah, okay, they can talk about machine to machine. They can talk about dynamic way of doing it. Whereas the service providers are always uh, happy to do static way because they have the visibility. So the challenges are there and obviously when you try to do with machine learning, you need to collect the data, you have to model and then once you model, you have to improve the model and ensure that end to end what Ever we want to achieve in the NFP automation, it's capable of doing that. And this is where I would say that uh, I see machine learning as a key role to play. What's machine learning? It's just a bunch of collecting data, modeling some phenomena and trying to see that we, in the closed loop, we try to get the uh, data points and ensure that we are able to deliver the automation. Now, we have Professor Gokhale who is an expert in this and before uh, I do, I will switch over to them and I know we have time limitation. Uh, we have 40 minutes to be exact. So I will give 20 minutes to Professor Gokhale who is not available here but he is speaking and I have recorded voice for him. And next followed that will be Michael Tien on the lab. So before I do anything, uh, this is what is in store for you. You know that um, we can of course have all these tags and uh, uh, new tags and define them, but we need to see how we approach this from ML point of view. So here I go, I will hand over to uh, Gokhale, Professor Gokhale. So let me start with him first. Go ahead Gokhale. Thanks, Prakash. You have set up the context well and made my job easy. Now, I shall present here aspects of machine learning and automation, by which I mean automation of provisioning of infrastructures in an intelligent manner. Can I have the next slide, please? The traditional manual deployment cycle is something which we all know. It starts with the provisioning of the resources, installing the needed components, configuring the components and deploying them on the physical infrastructure. Following this, we monitor the behavior and if needed, scale the resources to suit the demands. And we cycle all over. Uh, what are the infrastructure that needs to be provisioned? It starts off with the bare metal the hypervisor and probably the VM along with its booting properties. To some extent, uh, we provision the storage and also the underlying network. But off late, container based deployment is strongly advocated. Container runtime provides the underlying runtime support for container formats. And the CNI, the Container Network Interface, provides the underlying network connectivity for containers. Uh, the Kata project allows a lightweight virtual machine having a container, allowing you to run a container management tool directly on the bare metal without sacrificing workload isolation. Now this feature is gaining heavy traction in the OpenStack community and hence Kata based provisioning is also should be considered. Uh, this essentially means that the, there are various aspects that have to be considered when we talk about automated provisioning and each of these have their speciality features to be addressed to. Next slide please. And now the question boils down to why NFE automation needs a relook. The answer I think is pretty simple. Orchestration, management 
and maintenance of NFV and SDN clouds have become a very big challenge because they are now distributed and they are purely hybrid in nature. Uh, hence, it's imperative that this automated mechanism of provisioning is always the choice. Better is to have an intelligent provision mechanism driven by machine learning and artificial intelligence to meet the demands of these dynamic cloud management requirements. Now, in this context, uh, we will focus mainly on service and infrastructure management automation. Uh, later in this session, we shall share our experiences dealing with compute, that is Redfish, storage, stored fish and networking, that is the SDN van driven by machine learning and AI. Uh, does this mean, can we call this as hands-free or zero-touch NFV? Yeah, I guess so. Let's see in the subsequent uh, slides. Can I have the next slide, please? We shall be strong proponents for intelligent automation of deployment process. Why so? Let's look at some numbers. Now, 80% of all outages impacting mission critical applications are caused by manual operations, people and process related issues. Now, out of these, 50% are due to chain management, configuration lapses, handoff issues, release integration, and redeployment of applications and their services. Now, all of these are critical operational aspects, but done manually, they have a negative impact. Automation of these processes using templated scripts have proven to be fruitful. A number of downtime hours have reduced drastically, but owing to the complex nature of application, the cost of downtime is almost risen 50 times. Hence, there is a strong need for automating this deployment process, especially in an intelligent manner using a machine learning AI approach. The next slide, please. Uh, this slide depicts the points which allow us to monitor the deployment, collect the metrics and act upon them. Uh, I need some insights to be drawn and these insights can be drawn provided I have a monitoring mechanism about the current behavior of the process. So where do we get these learning inputs? Now obviously from the real-time analytics phase which gives the current behavior and the efficacy of the deployment. These are also the SLA metrics which can be correlated with the historical events. And they enable me to develop a behavioral model. Now each cycle allows me to learn a little bit more and generate a final mature model which can be used in the future for making optimized deployment decisions. And these decisions can be incorporated using a ML AI based model. Next slide please. So, what is intelligent infrastructure deployment? Uh, very simply put, it's a smart way to create, manage and orchestrate federation environment based on previous experiences learned. The machine learning driven system recognizes the dynamic demands and the deployment patterns in the context of the SLO metrics, the service level objective metrics. Now these metrics, also called as dimensions in the ML parallels, are processed by the ML algorithm and we devised optimized deployment strategy. Uh, the metrics we mention here are all essentially related to the SLO objective parameters which are definable and also measurable. Now, around 140 to 145 such metrics have been identified, some of which are termed as strong ones, which influence the deployment policy, while the other ones are 
termed as the weak ones, which do not have a major influence on the deployment policy. Uh, in this context, maybe a pruned decision tree eliminates the influence of the weak metrics. Now, overall outcome of this exercise is to identify an optimized deployment unit and optimizing container sizing resulting in a true agile infrastructure provisioning. Next slide, please. Uh, what is this intelligent infrastructure? Possibly, with an intelligent infrastructure deployment mechanism, I can realize intelligent infrastructure. Infrastructure that accommodates dynamic demands of mixed workloads. Optimized behavior is thus achieved by ensuring zero or minimal QoS violations. The machine learning algorithm needs to see large amounts of real-time performance data from embedded monitors which are set up on the QoS metrics together with network telemetry data. Now this data is used by our ML engine for training and model building purposes. Next slide please. Let us quickly visit the automated deployment process. Um, a static deployment strategy is one which uses templates for deployment. The provider offers flavors and uh, these flavors can be based on specific requirements. Now, depending upon the requirements, we can choose the flavor and once chosen, the resources are static unless completely redeployed. A dynamic deployment strategy, however, dynamically determines the context and the deployment parameters and uh, generates a deployment plan. But once defined, this deployment plan also remains unchanged. Uh, smart or intelligent deployment, however, uses machine learning AI based inferencing to optimize the service level objectives. The deployment plan is predicted evaluated, customized and optimized. Uh, to achieve this, we use what are called as Tosca documents. Now, we will talk about Tosca in a little more detail a little later. But Tosca documents are structured documents which describe uh, the entire context of the services and the applications to be deployed on the cloud. It's something like a meta file or a meta document, which gives a complete uh, structural information of the services and the applications which are uh, deployed on the cloud. We will uh, revisit uh, what is Tosca a little while later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what are the advantages of intelligent deployment? I guess these are reasonably obvious. They eliminate manual intervention, which is one of the main causes of outages. And they also eliminate the complexity in deployment, very complex configurations. Thus, uh, leading to optimized utilization of the resources. The next slide, please. Uh, we see in this diagram, the entire learning aspects of machine learning engine is totally based and on the training data, which is the result of uh, some real-time analysis of the SLA objective metrics. Uh, maybe we need to correlate this with the historical data generated. And uh, this gives me insights, which are further used for intelligent orchestration. Uh, the deployment and the description of this deployment is essentially made aware in the Tosca document. Now the question is, can I edit this document at runtime? If so, it realizes dynamic configurations described by runtime metrics. Uh, the Tosca document cannot be actually edited in runtime, but a fresh document can be created at runtime and you know, I can probably reprovision my resources in the context of a modified Tosca document. We will talk about that cycle a little later on. 
But before do do that, let us quickly understand what is a Tosca document. Next slide, please. Tosca uh, stands for topology and orchestration specification of the cloud applications. Is a, a, a document, a structured document, and uh, is an abstract YAML document that represents uh, the complete structural information of the application context that is being deployed. So it is a YAML document acting as a service template with a standard language notation to describe the application and the underlying infrastructure orchestration details. Uh, it's something like a XML file, uh, but not purely an XML file, but a YML file. Uh, it defines the applications and their infrastructure. It also specifies the interrelationship between various components and their composition, identifies the application state and associates all this with the cloud infrastructure management policies. Uh, this means the Tosca document defines the application and the bindings to the associated virtual and physical infrastructure. Uh, the best part is uh, the YML document is processable and it is processed at deploy time to perform both virtual and physical deployment. And any changes made to the deployment configuration can be reflected as changes to the Tosca document. Uh, I urge you to uh, look into how the Tosca document uh, is uh, structured. Uh, the uh, information is available uh, for reference uh, on the internet. Uh, as I was telling you and as I mentioned earlier on, any changes that are made to this deployment configuration uh, will be used to create the modifications that are needed for a redeployment of the resources. So this is typically done by dereferencing the current document and re-referencing the new one, the modified Tosca document. Next slide, please. Uh, the Tosca document essentially defines the syntactic structures for specifying an application's topology. And I mean uh, the structural information. And this is specified at three levels. Uh, the first level happens to be at the infrastructure level wherein we define the cloud and the data center related objects. The second level is the platform or the middleware level and this is used for defining the app containers. And the third level is the application modules and their entire configuration. Now for more details please refer to the OpenStack Tosca parser documentation and uh, this tells you how the a Tosca document is structured and how the parser can understand the uh, descriptors using which uh, provisioning can be made possible. Uh, next slide please. Uh, when we mention service orchestration, uh, it should also address orchestration aspects of the cloud infrastructure orchestration, the container orchestration, the network orchestration and also the application orchestration. Uh, only then we can realize a completely heterogeneous multi-platform distributed orchestration of all the services. Uh, next slide please. So let us now bring in uh, machine learning and let us very quickly look at the machine learning model. Now this slide illustrates a closed loop machine learning context. It starts off with a repository and the repository houses Tosca compliant templates. One appropriate template from these is selected and is used for the provisioning purpose. The provisioning is done by the orchestrator service 
which parses the YAML document and completes its job of deployment on the OpenStack cloud infrastructure. Next up, a service collects the Celometer logs and gathers performance metrics. Now these performance metrics are pretty important and these act as the main inputs which are fed into a machine learning engine. The ML engine builds and updates a model as part of its learning cycle. Uh, a candidate model is chosen which the conductor generates parameters and the Tosca document and the Tosca template is modified. Once the Tosca template is modified, a new deployment is initiated and this new template is stored back in the repository. Though this essentially is one sort of an epoch of a learning and uh, as my uh, machine learning algorithm matures, uh, the modifications typically optimize onto giving me a appropriate deployment mechanism suiting the exact requirements specified by the user. The next slide please. Uh, the training is implemented typically as a pruned decision tree in its simplest form. Uh, a pruned decision tree is good for low changing demand patterns. Uh, neural network based models are also good for uncorrelated demand patterns whilst the random forest implementations are best suited for fast varying dynamic demand patterns exhibiting nonlinear behavior. So uh, we cannot directly uh, suggest a single line approach. A little bit of experimentation needs to be done to find out which of the three models uh, suits uh, better. Next slide please. I have listed here a few of the example metrics. Uh, ML algorithms can be trained for more detailed and more specific dimensions. Uh, these dimensions could be uh, attributes from the service level orchestration uh, parameters, uh, the real time behavioral parameters, the delay time behavioral parameters and so on and so forth. Next slide please. Uh, let me mention briefly the technology stack that can be used. From the core implementation perspective, we can use Apache Kafka, Scala, Python and the Java programming languages. And models can be quickly built using Weka and the container support is offered by Docker and or by Kube. I leave it to the audience to explore more into suitable technologies for implementation purposes. Now with this, I call upon Mr. Prakash and Mr. Michael Tan to continue with the third part of the session. Thank you and uh, over to Mr. Prakash. Thank you Gokhale. Uh, it was good hearing you and uh, getting all the bases covered from ML side. Now from practical point of view, I would like to introduce Michael Tien from Dell Labs. He has been working with me on the lab side of it and we have tried to uh, explore what are the automation possibilities. So I will hand over to Michael Tien, give me a second and here we go. Michael, take over. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Tian from Service Provider Solution within Dell EMC. Today, we are looking at automation practical viewpoint from Dell EMC. Next. Redfish is the next generation system management standard for IT modernization. DMTF Scalable Platform Management Forum has created open industry standard specification and schema that provides simple, modern, and secure hardware platform management. A secure multi-node 
RESTful interface in JSON format through HTTPS. It consists human readable schema base that can be consumable by client application and browser based GUIs. Redfish also covers wide key use cases and customer requirements. Next. So, what Fish can do today? It's a common interface across multi platforms and vendors, supporting in such a control service power state, collective inventory service hardware and firmware information, monitor health status of server, retrieve system logs, and finally generating alerts reflecting server's health state. Next. Now, let's look at some of the benefits of Redfish. The benefits of Redfish run on top of current 14G server embedded server management, such as iDRAG9 with lifecycle controller. Next. In 14th generation iDRAG9 with Redfish, RESTful API enables modern, secure, and scalable management automation. Conformant with Redfish 1.2, which BIOS configuration, secure boot configuration, and firmware inventory and updates. iDRAG9 also enhances its RESTful API extension to profile-driven server configuration and update as well as the iDRAG configuration. Next. Let's look what modern tools can do with Redfish management automation. In the left side, we have server inventory process with Python script. This script sends get with server's credential to retrieve system and storage information, such as model, manufacturer, service tag, RAID controller, network adapters, and etc. Now take a look on the right hand side of the screen. On the right hand side, we are looking at the server's storage health, health from Postman script plugins. This provides a single pane of development workspace to deliver system automation and development. Next. IT developers are also adopting fast, reliable, and repeatable outcomes. On-demand runtime environment creation and as well as consistent way to staging the end production environment. Emerging orchestration tools and programming capability, such as infrastructure as a code, complete version control of code configuration, and data. Continue align both development and operation. Overriding goals, continue tuning desired state management for development, update, and configuration and control of iDRAG. Next. Server configuration profile enable REST API to configuration servers BIOS, iDRAG, lifecycle controller, per controller, network adapters, and HBS. API can be export, preview, and import the operation to replicate any existing server configuration or custom build server configurations. Server configuration profile can be stored 
via network shared, such as CIFS, NFS, HTTP, or HTTPS. Profile is present in XML or JSON formats. Update firmware can be operated via network-based repository. Automation, such as zero-touch configuration, is capable through network share base, such as CIFS, NFS, HTTP, or HTTPS. Next. So what's next for Redfish? Dell EMC and DMTF, driving additions to Redfish standard. Swordfish as external storage standards, network switch API standards, environmental API for power and HVAC, and operability with other community projects such as Open Compute Project, OpenStack, and other orchestration solutions. And finally, expand automation tools for developers. Next. Storage Networking Industry Association is also contributing to Redfish resource map. In block storage, provisioning with class of services control, value mapping and masking, replication, and capacity and health metrics. For file system storage, expand file system and file share capability. In addition, other areas such as provisioning with class of services and replication are extending in file system storage. Object storage are in the process. Next. The profile defined that require functionality to basic Swordfish, add-ons to Swordfish, certification, conformance, and energy star. In basic Swordfish, we have hosted service configuration as well as integrate service configuration. The add-on functionality to the Swordfish, they are local replication and remote replication. In the certification conformance requirements defined in the plans, Energy Star requirements combine the power and energy metrics as well as instrument on demand control. Next. At the Swordfish host service configuration level, all block file system and object storage are provisioned by the API through, uh, throughout its own classification, include storage subsystem, endpoint, status, disks, and etc. Next. At Swordfish integrate service configuration level, all block file system and object storage are provisioned by the API and its own storage service classifications. Next. Thank you. That concludes today's hands-free NFE. We now will open up for questions. So if you have any question, please. Uh, in the meantime, I can tell you something on what's next. What we have is uh, inquiries are coming from CSPs, that is the communication service providers and the carriers. Like how do we do end-to-end -end orchestration, especially in light of 5G uh, being uh, the roadmap from here on. So what we see is the 
first step in introducing ML is computational capability and that is where NOAA has got the virtual GPU support which is the first step and we hope that uh, this can be extended for use cases in high performance computing at the edge for the edge as well as for the IoT and for the 5G use cases. So this is the first blood OpenStack has drawn. It is up to the other communities to bring use cases whereby we can address that and we can uh, formalize it. That's what we are doing. I hope uh, those who can come to today in the evening for the edge session are bird of feather. We will get into how we can use edge for this. Thank you very much.